Hi there, it's really a privilege for me to continue sharing with you this powerful message around having a sound mind. This is so crucial in the development of our identity. We've been talking about an identity rehab and I've been focusing in on this whole issue of sound reasoning, sound mind. And we've been discussing over the last couple of weeks the whole issue of cognitive distortions or perceptual distortions. And I'm going to continue on that theme and I'm going to start off by talking about the 15th one. Okay, so if you've missed what we've been sharing about, you can catch up. Uh, we've got videos up. You can go to YouTube. You can go to our website, www.gochurch.co.za. We've got the notes there for you uh, to study and to pray through. Um, so the 15th one is inexact labeling, inexact labeling. This is something that we do very often, but we do it subconsciously, okay? This is where you feel a strong emotion, right, with regards to something, and then you speak out what you are feeling. But the thing is, because what you are feeling is quite intense, you speak out that which you are feeling at the same level of intensity, but it's still inaccurate. For example, you have with a lot of people, someone bumps them, right? Uh, let's say at the mall, you're shopping and someone bumps you, okay? What do you then say back to that individual, right? You, it's amazing the things people say. You see people uh, calling people all sorts of things that are very unchristian, all right? And that's because they were feeling this intense feeling and then they inaccurately labeled that particular individual. Unfortunately, those still count as judgments that we are releasing over people. And as Jesus said to us, with the same measure that you judge, you will be judged, Okay, so it's very important. So inexact labeling is where the affective, affective as an emotional uh, reaction is proportional to the descriptive labeling of the event rather than to the actual intensity of a traumatic situation. So they might call you a complete idiot. Okay, but you're not a complete idiot. You might have been a bit clumsy, right? You might not have been focused, right? Um, and what I saw is that very often we, we are not gracious toward other people and then our labeling of their behavior is inaccurate, all right? Um, the other day, uh, uh, my son, one of my boys was doing a test um, in my study and um, I had to finish off some printing I was doing. And in the process, he wanted to plug in his computer and in the process, he uh, took out the plug for the printer, OK, and I remember I wasn't extremely frustrated or anything, but I still stated quite firmly, oh, that's why the printer isn't working. You took the plug out. All right. I, I said it quite firmly. OK, I wasn't necessarily gracious about it, but I spoke quite firmly. Literally a few seconds later. All right. I was now looking for somewhere to plug in the printer. And what did I do? I removed another plug and I plugged in the printer. A moment later, my son says to me, Dad, has something happened to the internet? It's not working. And I quickly realized that I'd pulled out the plug for the internet, okay? And I think mine was the worst crime because it impacted more people. Because when I went and updated the other boys about what had happened, uh, they were like, oh, so that's why the Wi-Fi wasn't working. Oh, that's why. Oh, it impacted them, right? Because obviously, you know, they're doing some work from home. So um, let's be gracious toward people and let's make sure that um, even if we're feeling this intense feeling about certain things, it doesn't actually end up warping what we say about the thing. We need to still label things accurately. This is so, so important. Sometimes we have extreme reactions, yet we do the very thing that we have just reacted to. Isn't that true? Okay. James chapter 1 verses 19 to 21 says this, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, okay? Slow to speak and slow to become angry. Now, it's okay to have shoulds if it's a should that's in scripture. And so here we have an example of a should that's right in scripture, isn't it, right? Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. You see, sometimes we think our anger or intimidating someone, right, will get what we want. But that doesn't work. Doesn't work. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and 
humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. All right. So be careful of trying to control people by shaming them with your angry, crooked, witty remarks. Okay. Sometimes we control and manipulate people because of our intense reaction to a particular situation. Sometimes we do it intentionally. Sometimes that's what we're actually carrying in our hearts. And we need to be careful of this. Okay. Um, You know, Ben Zander, the great uh, conductor um, with the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra, um, he shares a powerful story with regards to the power of our words and the power of our reactions. And I want to share it with you because I think it's so, so powerful. So now I have one last thought, which is that it really makes a difference what we say, the words that come out of our mouth. I learned this from a woman who survived Auschwitz, one of the rare survivors. She went to Auschwitz when she was 15 years old. And um, her brother was eight and the parents were lost. And um, she told me this, she said, we were in the train going to Auschwitz and I looked down and I saw my brother's shoes were missing. And I said, why are you so stupid? Can't you keep your things together for goodness sake? The way an elder sister might speak to a younger brother. Unfortunately, it was the last thing she ever said to him because she never saw him again. He did not survive. And so when she came out of Auschwitz, she made a vow. She told me this. She said, I walked out of Auschwitz into life and I made a vow and the vow was, I will never say anything that couldn't stand as the last thing I ever say. Such a powerful lesson for us in terms of the words that we release and the inexact labeling. Don't speak out and release things that you end up regretting one day. Let's look at the next one. It's number 16 and it's primacy and recency effect, what's known as the primacy and recency effect. And sometimes when I'm teaching on conflict and conflict resolution, I like to talk about this. Okay. Uh, It's also quite powerful when you're talking about prejudice um, and just unpacking it, uh, you'll see it will make sense to you. So the primacy effect is the beginning. You remember it because that's where you started. The recency effect is the finish. You remember the end the best. So if I give you a long list of names to remember, right? Um, Research has shown that you're more likely to remember the ones at the end, like the most recent ones that you've said. That's the recency effect, all right? Um, The most recent ones you've memorized and the first ones, okay? And then we tend to forget what's in the middle, right? But what's in the middle is still important. And this happens in life. You meet up someone, right? You get to know them. And first impressions matter. They count, right? Because that was your first interaction with that individual. But also the last impression counts, right? And research has actually shown that very often uh, it's the last impression that actually weighs more heavily than the first impression, right? And we use this, don't we? Those of us in business, we want to give people positive recent experiences of us. So we phone them up. We have a catch-up call. Um, often when I go to a particular client, I might be dealing with just one department, but I'll remember, oh, there was so-and-so from the other department. Let me pop in and say hi. I pop in, I say hi, I connect with them a little bit, okay? Despite how tired I'm feeling, despite how busy I am. um, And then a few weeks later, that person is calling me. Oh, Paul, we need you to do this. We need you to do that. Where does that come from? I'm now top of mind. All right. I'm now top of mind. You see it even happening where, um, you know, often if I'm teaching on personal branding, for example, how to build your personal brand. I, in my seminars, I actually show people pictures of famous people. And I get them to comment on that particular person's brand or what comes to mind when you see that person. And I still remember after the the U.S. Open, the Women's U.S. Open, a situation where uh, some of you might know the story where Serena Williams was quite upset and so on. And there was that rant she had, you know, with the with the umpire. But I remember showing a clip of her just after a picture of her just after that had taken place. And instead of people saying the usual things they would say about Serena, 
you know, comments also came up about how she had been in that particular uh, game. All right. So I realized that, oh, that's to do with the recency effect. Sometimes we forget everything about someone, but we just remember what's top of mind because of a recent event. All right. Um, and this often, unfortunately, skews our judgment and it skews our decision making with regards to people. All right. So whether it's a pastor or a leader or uh, whoever you're dealing with, maybe someone you report to, ask yourself, am I judging them accurately? Am I judging them based on my entire experience with them or just on my most recent experience? Sometimes we judge people on our first experience with them, all right? And then we don't give the relationship time and then we make bad judgment calls with regards to that particular person. So primacy and recency effect um, it's really a bias that a lot of people have, and it affects us in terms of sound reasoning, sound reasoning, okay? So we have a tendency to be greatly influenced by first experiences, positive recent experiences, or negative recent experiences, okay? And this is why people are fickle in their opinions of other people based on what, have they, what they've experienced most recently, all right? That's why sometimes you say, why is this person so changeable? Yesterday, they were just praising this person and this person was such a hero. Now, literally today, they're saying the opposite, okay? Uh, we need to be careful about that as we judge situations. I believe that as we mature as leaders, God wants to take us to a place where we are great leaders with sound judgment, okay? Uh, sound judgment, very important. Now, this is also related to what's known as the availability heuristic. The availability heuristic, or more generally, we can call it the availability bias. Now, the availability bias is to do with what's easy to recall what's easy to recall. So sometimes we place more weight on things that just came up first in our minds and we're not even aware of the fact that we're doing it. You see it happening when it comes to news, okay? And your emotional state being affected by the news. Even though the thing that has just been spoken of in the news is talking about another town, but also, but, but, but literally you then are afraid to go to bed at night but you've just watched something that was focused on another town or another city or another country, or you watch a carte blanche and it's talking about um, a water problem in another region, okay, caused by poor uh, management in the municipality there. And then all of a sudden you become super hyper vigilant and you invest a lot of money, really wasting a lot of money into, we're going to have this filtration system and this and this and this and this. And it's like, whoa, 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 okay. That was news about that place. But because it's now top of mind for you, you're wearing, weighing it so heavily and you no longer have sound reasoning with regards to that particular thing. So we need to be careful about this, okay? So the availability bias is a mental shortcut that people take when assessing a situation, when they're making a decision or a judgment on a matter, right? There's the assumption that this alternative has weight because it was top of mind and recalled first. Be careful about this. You might be wanting to purchase a property in a particular area, right? And then um, you've had a conversation with a couple of friends recently and they were burgled and they live in that area, okay? And you're like, oh, that area, oh, there's a lot of burglary. Meanwhile, if you actually do the stats, the place you're currently living in has got more crime than where you want to move to if you actually look at it statistically, as opposed to the availability bias, okay? Or the availability heuristic. So let's watch out for that. You see, back in the 60s, people thought, researchers thought that, you know what? Human beings are really rational creatures. You know, they're so rational in the decisions that they make, okay? But now we've begun to understand that uh, we're not that rational when it comes to decision-making. And they're using this knowledge when it comes to buying behavior, consumer psychology, okay? Very powerful area to study that sometimes you go into a shop and the reason you purchase a particular thing, it's not very rational. You didn't necessarily think it through. You know, it's been found that 95% of buyers are imitators. So I feel more comfortable getting something if I know that someone else also got it uh, recently. I don't necessarily do all the research, but I make decisions like that. So we're not always that rational when it comes to our judgment calls. And I believe that God wants us to make sound decisions and sound decision making, 
all right, involves being aware of the biases we have in our minds, okay, uh, the mental shortcuts we take when it comes to making decisions, especially important decisions. This is so important, you see. If you're aware of the irrational nature of your decisions, that's one thing, but very often we're actually unaware of um of these, these dynamics that we are talking about, the irrational nature of our decisions, okay? So I wanna ask you some questions. How long does it take for you to get worried about something? How long does it take for you to actually get worried about something, okay? Is it one phone call from someone and you're thrown, okay? Uh, is it a news report from someone and you're thrown, okay? How long does it take you to get worried, right? Um, and then when you hear some news, to what extent do you conduct your own research on the matter before making decisions? To what extent do you conduct your own research on the matter, right, before you actually make decisions, okay? Another question I want to ask you is, whose words and opinions do you trust? Whose words and opinion do you trust? It's amazing how we've got certain people we trust, and whenever that person says something, we're like, oh, so-and-so said this. I see some people, you suddenly see the person looking so down, so gloomy, and you can trace it to an email they received or a phone call. But it will tend to be from sources that they believe are uh, worth listening to. But then the question is, what are your value equivalents of trust? You know, why do you trust this person and not that person? What is it based on? Okay. Um, do not judge a person or a situation by your most recent experience of that situation or of that person. Okay. It's important for us to understand that um, there's so much to people. Um, just because in the last three weeks, you've had a difficult marriage, your husband hasn't been that great, that's not the sum total of your marriage. Just because your boss has been stressed out and has said some nasty things to you uh, in the last few weeks, that's not the sum total of your relationship with your boss, okay? Just because your kids have been a bit rebellious and uh, talking back quite a bit and so on in the last two weeks, that's not a summation of your whole experience with your kids and your future experience with your kids. Okay, so relationships have moments and it's important to judge those relationships, not based on the moment, but based on the entirety of the relationship. Very important. Okay, now, if Jesus was like that, if Jesus had this availability bias, availability heuristic, if Jesus operated on the primacy and uh, recency effect, uh, we would have issues, we would have issues. Okay, he would have disqualified Peter when Peter denied him. Okay. Do you remember there was a time when Peter then also said to Jesus, um, uh, he was basically discouraging Jesus with regards to the cross, you know, trying to give Jesus another strategy. And what did Jesus say? He says, get thee behind me, Satan. Okay. Because you're not interested in the things of God. This is Jesus rebuking Peter. But you know that soon afterwards, here's Jesus commending Peter and saying, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. When Peter said, uh, you are the Messiah, when Jesus was asking, who am I, who am I, who am I, right? Who do you say I am? Others say this, others say that, okay? Next thing he's saying, on this rock, I'm going to build my church, the rock of the revelation of Christ that Peter had, okay? Another occasion, we had a situation where Peter denies Christ and so on, but soon afterwards, God empowers him and look at the powerful sermon he preaches at Pentecost, okay? Now, Jesus could have just written him off. Dude, I'm not too sure I can trust you, you know? You faded, you faded on me, you know? Uh, when I was in a most difficult time, look what you did. You bailed out on me, right? But you're still a Christian. Um, sorry, it's a it's a joke. Christian Bale, the actor, okay? You bailed out on me, but you're still a Christian. Anyway, some of you got that. But the point is that um, we judge people based on our most recent experience, but people change and we actually need to give them the benefit of the doubt, okay? Um, it's not the whole story. What you did to me yesterday isn't the whole story, right, of our relationship. Very important. In the book of Psalms uh, 112, Verses six to seven, I'm going to read from the Berean Study Bible, okay? It says, surely he will never be shaken. Okay, it's talking about the righteous man and the blessing of the righteous man, right? The righteous man will be remembered forever. He will not fear bad news. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. One of the marks of having a sound mind 
all right, and walking in true righteousness is that you will not fear bad news. Some translations say he will not fear evil tidings. The blessing of righteousness is that you don't panic when bad news comes. I want to ask you, when was the last time you panicked when you heard bad news? Maybe it was, you know, a debt collector phoning you and threatening you. Maybe it was a situation where you saw something on the news and it's something that applies to the whole nation. Maybe you read some statistics, but often stats can be skewed, can't they? All right. So it's really important that we come to a place where we don't fear bad news. Right. I remember someone who got some bad news and they literally wanted to take their own life literally wanted to take their own life. A few days later, um, things turned around. And I remember saying to the person, look what happened to you. You wanted to take your own life based on the report you got. But now there's this breakthrough. Imagine you had taken your life, okay? Things turn around, right? Life does not remain the same. The situation that you're in right now, you won't be in forever. You will look back one day and you'll say, yo, those were three very difficult years or five very difficult years, okay? One day when you're 85, you'll look back and you'll say, but I'm so glad that I pushed on and I didn't give up because look at the wonderful grandchildren I now have. Look at the uh, business successes I've since had since um, that difficult trying time, okay? Uh, so let's judge a matter at the end of a matter, not prematurely. You will not, I declare this over you, you will not fear bad news. People will say things around you and so on and you'll be able to just say, mm -mm, whose report are you going to believe? I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. Remember that song, the, I think it was Ron Canoli, okay? Whose report shall you believe? I'll, re I'll believe the report of the Lord, okay? Amen. The 17th one that we're going to talk about, and I've been alluding to this for some time, is uh, an interesting cognitive distortion, and it's the one to do with social comparison, social comparison. And some of you might have studied this, but there are powerful uh, theories around this. There was a guy called Festinger uh, who popularized the social comparison theory. And I just want to really delve into it and deal with it from the scriptures and look at many dimensions of the comparisons we make. OK, I want to say from the get go, you are unique. You are unique. OK, do not compare yourself with other people. Rather, compare yourself with your potential. Why do I always say this? Why do I always say this? Because the thing is, your goals in life aren't the same as other people's goals. So when you compare yourself with other people around you, you're using the wrong measure. You're using the wrong measure. I see a lot of people saying things like, oh, I was the first one in my family to get a degree. And they're so proud of themselves that they got that degree. And maybe they're the only person in their family with a degree. And part of their rejoicing is the fact that they've been differentiated from everyone else. OK, but the thing is, they're now resting on their laurels because they're better academically than the people around them. But the problem is that if you're surrounded by average people, right, and you are proud of yourself because you're slightly better than average people, but maybe you're operating at 53%, okay? Yes, it's a pass. But if you compare yourself with your potential, and I'm just talking academically, maybe you should have two PhDs by now, all right? So don't compare yourself with the people around you, all right? Um, I've, I've just joined a particular uh, uh, running and uh, triathlon club, but I'm focused on the running part. And, you know, you go there and there are people of different shapes and sizes, different age groups, okay? I can't be so proud of myself that, oh, look how, I, how quick I passed that person because maybe it's someone who's female and who's 20 years older than me, all right? Or 30 years older than me. All right. So they're, they're different people and I need to run my own race. And I see this happening so much with many people. Some of you might have heard the story that my wife has shared and she shares it really well. But a summary of it was she was doing a particular triathlon uh, race. She wanted to make podium. So she wanted to have a top three finish. And at a certain point, she started feeling a bit discouraged because she would see this lady. I think the lady had this. Um, she describes the lady as having this red uh, tri suit, I think. And, you know, going going past and she was like, oh, no, I'm not going to make podium. And I think another person passed her and so on. And she was thinking, oh, what's going on? But she did so well in that particular race, okay? She got that top three finish and she realized that, wait a minute, these people that were passing me, this one or two people that passed me, they were running a different race. They were doing the duathlon. They weren't doing the triathlon, okay? And sometimes we do that a lot, don't we? 
right? We do that a lot, don't we? Where we literally are comparing ourselves with people to other people around us who are running a different race in life, okay? But we're now feeling discouraged because we feel like they're passing us by, you know? I remember some uh, people who I've mentored before, you know, you see them coming to me and they'll say, ah, oh, but uh, Paul, how did you get this? And you're now doing this, hey, Paul, you, this is intimidating when we're around you. And then you've already done this and this and this. And, this. and I'm thinking to myself, this is a guy who's about, you know, 10 years younger than me saying what he's saying. And I'm like, you know what? Give yourself time. Take your time. Don't compare yourself um, to me, right? Uh, because number one, I've been around uh, for many more years than you. Number two, I'm on a different journey, okay? If you are called to be a missionary in China, right? Don't sit comparing yourself with friends who are stockbrokers on Wall Street saying, oh, they're making so much money. They're making so much money. We will be rewarded one day based on our faithfulness, faithfulness to our calling, okay? Do not use the wrong measure. Recently, I went and bought a scale, you know, to weigh, to weigh yourself like a scale, right? And it was, it's those nice digital ones, all right? Long story behind that, but I bought this particular scale. When I weighed myself, I realized that on this new scale that was more accurate, I was about three and a half kgs heavier than on the old scale. Okay. Um, now, potentially that could obviously be quite discouraging because I'd shared testimonies of weight, weight loss. You know, I had theories about which runs are better for me than others. Uh, there are all sorts of things I would say, right? Uh, I, now I discovered that, wait a minute, I'm actually three and a half kgs heavier than I thought. All right. It's fine. We'll just take it from the top and continue. But the point I'm making is I had developed certain mindsets, certain theories, right? A certain emotional state based on a skewed scale, a skewed way of measuring. And many of us do this. We feel so good about ourselves, right? But we're comparing ourselves with people who are average. We feel so holy and spiritual, you know, and prayerful, but we're comparing ourselves with people who are average, all right? Um, this is so important. And that's why it's foolishness, all right? playing the comparison game. Another major area we compare ourselves is uh, we try to keep up with the Joneses, don't we? You know, the concept, keeping up with the Joneses. The Jones get this, you also want it. You know those people who come, they visit you, and they literally, you can see them looking around the house, looking around, seeing, like, oh, they've got this, they've got this. A few weeks later, you see, you go and visit them, and you see at their house, they've got the exact same lounge suite, exact same fridge, you know? It happens, doesn't it, okay? Now, the thing is this, the thing is this, there's, there's some comparisons that are okay. There are others that are problematic. You see, it's to do with the meaning that you place on that comparison. You see, it's fine to say, oh, he's tall, he's short. Okay, that's just a description. There's no value equivalent. There's no judgment you're making about that. Okay, oh, uh, my car is bigger than your car. Let's rather use my car because there'll be lots of people in the vehicle. Okay, it's a comparison you're making, but it's a healthy comparison. It's a valid one, right? It's constructive. But there's a problem when the meaning you attach to the comparison, right, ends up resulting in you saying self-deprecating things about yourself. And we see this happening a lot. So you're there trying to keep up with the Joneses, but you don't know the Joneses story, okay? You don't know the Joneses story. So you want to live in that estate where the Jones live, right? But you don't understand that the Jones can live in that expensive estate because uh, for many years, they didn't have to pay bonds. They didn't have to pay the bank back, right? For money they'd borrowed for a house because they actually inherited their first house. So they were building up their business, ended up with quite a bit of cash and now can live in that particular estate, right? You want a car like person X, who's a good family friend of yours, right? But you don't understand how much debt the person X is really in, all right? And, uh, and this is the space a lot of people live in. Live within your means, live within your means, be patient, be patient, Okay, uproot the value equivalents of success that are in your life. There are a lot of value equivalents we have of success. If I do this, if I go to this college, if I go to that school, that's a picture of what success looks like. Okay, um, just be careful of, of that. Now, according to some studies, as much as 10% of our thoughts involve comparisons of some kind. As much as 10% of our thoughts, I'm sure with some people it's even more, okay? So we tend to compare along the lines of money, 
along the lines of attractiveness. Okay, that's quite a common one, isn't it? Right? Um, it's actually been found that when men walk around, they tend to look at women. When women walk around, they tend to look at other women. Okay? And so that person who's saying, oh, lovely hair. Oh, nice. I, I love your color blocking and so on. Yes, they're saying that and it's nice and kind. But a lot of times there's that evaluation taking place. You know, how do I measure up against this particular person? What do I need to enhance in myself? Okay? Be careful of continuously making comparisons that are not great. I know it's sometimes healthy to make comparisons that motivate and enhance us, but very often we're continuously comparing ourselves. There's some women out there who will only be friends with other women who are more plain looking than them because they feel good in those relationships because that person around you is always saying, oh, you look so lovely. Oh, you look so lovely. And then now when you're with that other person who looks like a model, right, you're, all, you, you're self-deprecating. Right. You have you say self-deprecating things about yourself. Right. Oh, look at her body. Oh, look how she. Oh, she's always like this. Oh, it's her nails. Did you see her manicuring is so perfect. Oh, and then you don't feel great around that person, but potentially they could be an awesome friend. So you avoid them and you just hang out with your plain looking friends. OK, again, uh, something we need to be careful of. So we tend to compare along lines of money, along lines of the lines of attractiveness along the lines of the quality of marriage. You know, people do that, okay? Oh, look what her husband got for him. Yes, her husband got that for, for her, sorry. <laughs> got that for her, right? But the reality is that her husband is emotionally not there, all right? So don't just look at one thing, one facet, and say, but look what he bought for my friend, you know? Look what he did. Yes, but the quality of the marriage is not the same as yours okay something to think about <clears throat> so we compare along different lines we even make comparisons with regards to proximity of relationship have you noticed that so in church settings there are a lot of uh, statements that can be made like yeah i know i know that person is the pastor's favorite yeah i know that yeah i know that person is very close to the pastor but ask yourself how did you come to that conclusion because sometimes people will say that right and it's just because of the value equivalence. It's because they saw the pastor hugging that person. But maybe the person is just a huggable person. You know, there's some people in church who are very huggable, the huggable type, right? Uh, or they saw the pastor laughing with that individual. But maybe they just support the same football team and they were laughing about a particular thing and share the same, same sense of humor. But the pastor doesn't necessarily actually feel that close to that individual. So sometimes we have a snapshot of a situation. We make a comparison that that's the in-group. Those are the people who are really tight with the church leaders. But us, we are on the outside. Based on what? Very often it's a cognitive distortion. It's a cognitive distortion, okay? So we are often making these evaluations, making these evaluations. When you are around more successful people, I want to ask you this question. When you are around more successful people, does it empower and enhance you or do you end up having self-deprecating thoughts? You see, there's some people, especially people with a healthy self-esteem, right? They like being around so-called successful people because it inspires them, right? It boosts them. It helps them to go to their next level. But there are others when they see that, oh, this person is making money. Oh, this person has got it all together. Look how they are parenting their children. What do they do immediately? They turn in, look on themselves, look at themselves. They end up getting self-absorbed and feeling like a failure. You know the friends I'm talking about. You share testimony with them. Instead of them actually feeling inspired and rejoicing with you, what are they doing? Oh, I wish I could also do that. What about me? Oh, so when it comes to comparisons that we make and evaluations that we make, it's often dependent on the level of your self-esteem. It's often dependent on the level of your self-esteem, how you make those comparisons, right? Whether they work well for you or they don't, okay? Uh, massive cognitive distortion, okay? Sometimes we are quite skewed in our judgments in this particular area. So for example, you might think you are an unsociable person right? But there's a psychological tendency in us when we come up with that evaluation, it's based on comparing ourselves with the most sociable people that we know. Have you noticed that, right? So you judge yourself based on the best around you, okay? Um, we always talk about it, my wife and I, because we say, you know what, uh, in the club that we are part of, there's some elite athletes 
And these guys are like 18, 19, 20, 21. We can't compare ourselves with them, okay? They're elite athletes, okay? That's the main thing they're doing in their lives. They want to go professional. That's their life dream, all right? Be careful of comparing yourself with the best in your industry, for example, okay? Is that your calling? Is that your calling to be that, right? Compare yourself with yourself. So important. In fact, compare yourself with your potential. You see, there's you as you currently are, but there's you as you desire to be. And that's all to do with identity, by the way. And there's some people who see themselves based on their current state, their current reality, and others see themselves based on their future reality. Okay? So my question to you is, what drives your tendency towards making social comparisons? When you're making those comparisons, what's driving it? Is it because you want to reinforce your inferiority complex? So you compare yourself with great people out there just to remind yourself how useless you are? That's literally what a number of people do, okay? Or are you this person who's got a massive ego and some narcissists are like that, so they're differentiating themselves all the time? And so their mindset is, I want to keep everyone beneath me, right? I want to keep everyone beneath me. So I'll evaluate myself against you to make sure you're always beneath me. So I want to know, so how fast can you run? And I'm not asking because I'm genuinely curious and I want to, I'm curious, I'm interested in you. I want to just make sure you're beneath me because my, the, my way of measuring myself is by my superiority over you. It's very subtle, but people do it. Not just narcissists, by the way, okay? But a lot of people do that, okay? What drives your tendency towards making social comparisons? What's driving that behavior? Often those with higher status can, can actually be hypervigilant with regards to competition as they have more to lose. Have you noticed that? You know, you go into an environment, you're not that good at it, uh, you're just learning, you want to grow. And so you're not that competitive about it because you already know you're very average, okay? But that person who's got the top spot, what are they doing? There's lots of pressure because there's lots to lose. And so they're always looking behind them, looking behind them. And the moment you start getting faster than them, it could be in sport or uh, getting more skilled or scoring more goals. What happens? You see they're very hypervigilant and it actually affects their performance because sometimes hypervigilance is associated with anxiety, isn't it? Okay. Um, <clears throat> So downward comparisons tend to occur in cases where individuals had experienced a threat to their self-esteem and these produced more favorable self-evaluations. So what happens is when your self-esteem is being threatened, your tendency now is, you know what, let me compare myself with people who I know are worse off than me so that I feel good about myself. It's very subtle, but it happens. You see some athletes, you know, don't like hanging out with top athletes because they don't feel good in their company, but they love being with people who aren't as good as them because those people see them as heroes and are always praising them, okay? Um, competitiveness also increases as proximity to a standard of performance increases. So in environments where there's a standard of performance, environments where there's a standard of wealth, like, you know, this is first class, this is second class, you know, in those environments, you find yourself becoming more competitive because it's easier to measure who's in the in-group, who's in the out-group. Let's have a look at scripture around this. In Galatians 6, verse 4 to 5, the Bible says, each one should test their own actions. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. So important. And I like it in the NLT. Pay careful attention to your own work. For then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. You see, if you're focused so much on just looking over the wall all the time, what's everyone else doing? You'll never experience the satisfaction of a job well done. You'll do your job well, but because someone else next to you is doing a better job, then you feel terrible, okay? Um, they can take pride. They can get satisfaction of a job well done. And you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else for we, we are each responsible for our own conduct. You see that with your kids, don't you? You know, you give them something. It might be a packet of sweets, 
Okay, and they're very happy about the packet of sweets until they start looking around and seeing what did my brothers get? What did my sisters get? You see that, right? And then the level of happiness somehow changes when they see what the other people got. It's like bonuses in your organization. You're happy when you receive a bonus until you see what someone else got, okay? There's something in us. It's a justice thing in us as human beings called perceived equity. There must be perceived equity, all right? The perception of equity um, in order for us to feel good about a particular thing. I like 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. It says here, this is Paul, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves, right, and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Some translations say they are ignorant, okay? This is so, so important to literally unpack this. The word classify there, where it says we do, we do not dare to classify, right? It means to count yourself among. You see, very often when there's a spirit of comparison, right, we actually create standards that aren't in the word, and we create classes, classes of people, classes of athletes, classes of musicians, okay? And it's an ungodly thing to do right? We need to operate from an, a biblical mindset, a renewed mind. So we create these classes and then we dare to classify ourselves among those classes, right? We're amongst those classes where we desire to be in that in-group. That's what he's talking about here. He's saying, I don't desire to be in that in-group. You guys have created a class for yourselves, right? But that's foolish, number one, the fact that you've created that class. Number two, I won't classify myself amongst you, all right? I'm not trying to be in the in-group. I'm not trying to be in with you, okay? Because I don't believe in those classifications, okay? And some of you have experienced this, right? You've got this desire to be an executive, right? And you want to be an executive in your organization and you're like, I'm now on that exco, right? But then it goes further. It's like, I'm now eating my lunch as one of them, my special lunch in that executive boardroom. You know, I'm now in. Be careful of that mindset. And then you start relating differently to people, right? And that's the fallacy of change. Once I become an executive, then all my problems will be solved. No, there'll be new problems also, right? So uh, this is so, so powerful. So are you trying to be in some in-group that you've exalted, right? Based on a standard and a measure that is actually foolish, okay? These are the fasties. These are, those are the slowies. Who says that? Because there's such a continuum, right? And compared to other people, maybe they're all actually slow, right? Who does that? Who does that? Who creates these things? Okay. So uh, we must be careful of this. In an upward social comparison, right? Upward social comparison, people want to believe themselves to be part of the elite or superior, Okay, and they make comparisons highlighting the similarities between themselves and the comparison group. Unlike a downward social comparison where similarities between individuals or groups are disassociated. Okay, um, <clears throat> there was some interesting uh, research that was also carried out uh, where they found that upward social comparisons were good in circumstances where the individuals making the comparisons had high self-esteem because these types of comparisons provided them with more motivation and hope than downward social comparisons, okay? And I've touched on that. However, if these individuals had experienced a recent threat or a setback to their self-esteem, they reported that upward comparisons resulted in a more negative effect than downward comparisons, okay? so. How does it affect you when you compare yourself upward? How does it affect you when you compare yourself downward? Okay, very important. Even for people with low self-esteem, these downward social comparisons do improve their negative mood and allow them to feel hope and motivation for their future. Okay, so we see that happening. Now, um, I mentioned to you earlier on that grandiosity is a core trait of many individuals high in narcissism, but seeing themselves as superior also requires seeing everyone else as beneath them, 
Okay, are you that person who has to see everyone else as beneath you? You know, one of the things which irritates me is those people who are always cracking jokes, but they never laugh at anyone else's jokes. That's a poor sense of humor. A sense of humor is not just you making people laugh. A sense of humor is also you being able to laugh at, at other people's jokes, okay, and find other people funny. But there's some people who are so controlling and kind of feel like, you know what, I need to be the one shaping things here. Okay, and then they feel good about themselves based on that, but it's deeply rooted in insecurities. Okay, now a common social comparison is that being different equals being bad. You know, those people where if they're the odd one out, they feel like an outsider and they think that, oh, so I'm terrible. I remember one person I was coaching and um, she was in a situation where she did one of those tests, personality tests. She had just moved into a new department and she was like, Paul, you know what? I'm the only one who came out like on this side of the wheel. Everyone else was on the other side. And she was quite devastated by this. And I said, just check with your boss, you know, because maybe that's why you were hired. And she confirmed with me at the next session that, you know what, Paul, you were right. I checked with my boss. They actually wanted something someone who was different. Okay. So different doesn't always equal bad. So when you evaluate yourself against other people, just be careful that you don't put a negative label on the fact that you're different. Maybe it's actually a good thing. You know, uh, opposites attract. Okay. That's, it's, it's a fact. It's, it's a well-known fact that very often people are drawn to people that have got stuff in them that they don't actually have because they end up thinking that this person will complete the team or this person will complete me. You know, you've got that mindset. So why is it that we think I have to be the same as you? Okay, we have to be the same as each other to like each other. No, sometimes we're drawn to each other because of the unique things that we add. So we're supposed to be different in a beautiful way, not in an odd way. You know, there's some people who are just different for the sake of being different. Okay, they've got a contrary spirit. You say we're going right. They say, no, I want to go left. All right. I'm not talking about that just in case that that fits for you. Okay, so sometimes opposites attract. So. My question also is, why do you compare yourself with the world? Why do you compare yourself with the world? Those of you who compare yourselves with the world, why? Why do Christians do that? Do we not know who we are in Christ? Do you know that something so central to the Christian identity, something so central to our kingdom identity is that we are citizens of heaven. We're citizens of heaven. Philippians 3.20 says, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, that's so powerful. In John 17, verse 15, I'm reading from the Berean Study Bible. It says, I am not asking, this is Jesus praying. I'm not asking that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. So if you're not of the world, why do you compare yourself with the world and the world standards, right? Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And that's what we need. We need to be sanctified by the truth so that we've got to, we compare ourselves with kingdom standards. Where am I at concerning God's standards and the way of the kingdom, not the way of the world? Because the world has got its own standards. Okay. What's, what worldly standards are you using, right? That you're measuring yourself up against. Stop doing that. All right. Um, I'm a citizen of heaven and this is part of my kingdom identity. So what is citizenship? What are the benefits of being a citizen? Okay. You know, that when you're a citizen of a particular country, there's certain jobs you can get that other people don't get because there's certain jobs that are just designated for citizens. Right now, in the spirit realm, there's certain things that God has earmarked for you because you're a believer who knows him. Okay. There's certain jobs. You, you don't hear people saying, oh, our new deputy president, he's from Zambia. You know, you don't hear that. Okay. Because there has to be someone who's a citizen of the country. Right. Right. So. Um, the grants that you can get that are only for citizens, right? There's special awards that are only for citizens. There are national colors where you can represent your country because you're a citizen of that country. You can't represent your country if you're not a citizen of that particular country, all right? So there, there's certain privileges you get. There's access to other nations based on the fact that you're a citizen of your nation because of an agreement that, that, uh, that your nation has with that other nation. OK, all those uh, tripartite agreements nations have with each other. OK, benefits in terms of uh, when you import certain goods from that particular country, if there's certain agreements, when you export, etc. OK, there are benefits of kingdom citizenship. And this is part of our identity. And we need to know what that is. And when we know what that is, we will not keep comparing ourselves with people of this world.
Okay, in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 18, it says, For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. If you operate by the world's standards, you're commending yourself based on the world's standards. I don't know about you, but I want to look to God and make sure that I'm being commended by him based on his standards. Okay, not the world's standards. So again, some questions I want to ask you. Are you using the world's standards or God's standards to measure yourself. Think about it. Are you using the world's standards of beauty? Because when I look at the word of God, the Bible says that, you know, uh, we should not be so concerned about our outward beauty. Okay. That true beauty is not made up based on your outward appearance, but it's the inner beauty. It's the inner beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. That's what scripture tells us right? So am I focused on that particular standard or am I so consumed with the externals, okay? How have you been affected emotionally based on the standard of measurement you have chosen to use? How have you been affected emotionally, like me with the scale, right? Based on the standard of measurement that was skewed, okay? If you're using the world's standards, well, you'll be affected negatively emotionally, Okay. According to Thornton and uh, Arrowwood, self-evaluation is one of the functions of social comparison. You see, often we'll compare ourselves with people just to evaluate ourselves. Okay. Are we making a righteous evaluation? Okay. For self-evaluation, people tend to choose a comparison target that is similar to themselves. Okay. Specifically, they're most interested in choosing a target who shares some distinctive characteristic with themselves. Okay. So it's like, okay, let me see. Yeah. I was the first black person to do this. Yeah. And the other black people. Yeah. yeah. If I compare myself to the other black people, in the, why are you just comparing yourself with black, black people only? Okay. And often, often those black people come from very different backgrounds. Some are advantaged, some are disadvantaged. But we just use surface level features and we feel like, you know what, that's what I'm going to use. You know, yeah, that person, yeah, is similar to me in this way and this way. Let me use it. That person looks a bit like me. Let me use that. Oh, he's the same age. Age is not the only variable, right? Downward social comparison is a defensive tendency that is used as a means of self-evaluation. Research has suggested that social comparisons with others who are better off or superior or upward comparisons can lower your self-regard, whereas downward comparisons can elevate your self-regard. Obviously, that depends on your current self-esteem, okay? Powerful stuff, reflect on it, okay? Don't just listen to this message as a once-off, but look at the notes and really go deep into this and because it actually affects your happiness level, this um, aspect of comparison. It actually affects your level of joy, okay? And then the, the final and 18th one that I'm going to look at today is this cognitive distortion, and I've called it, I am the only one. I am the only one. I remember being in a particular seminar and I was running this seminar and a particular lady, a black female, and there's a reason I'm saying that, she said, it's difficult for me in my department because I am the only one. I'm alone. And she wasn't meaning when she said that, that she's the only person in the department. She was basically saying, I'm the only one who looks like me, who's my age, who's my gender in that particular department. And I had to challenge that thinking and, and say to her, okay, um, can you view that situation differently? Because you're defining yourself as I am alone. But can you just think through some aspects of common ground that you have with the other people, because she was highlighting that the other people in my department are older and they are white Afrikaans male, okay? And I started to say to her, maybe you've got certain things in common with them. For example, you're in the same department, so your profession is the same, right? Maybe their grandkids go to the same school as your kids, okay? Maybe there's common ground. There's an exercise I like to do when I'm running certain workshops where I get people to go into the middle of the circle if they've got certain things in common. And I literally shout out certain things and there's a dance to it. And I say, uh, if you were head boy or head girl at your school and you see them rushing into the middle, if you support Kaiser Chiefs and you see them rushing into the middle, and it's amazing how the people who are in the center at the time when I call out the particular uh, construct or, um, you know, circumstance or situation, they're quite different. And I say to them, were there any surprises? 
and you hear people saying, yeah, you know what? I didn't expect her to be, to be a Kaiser chief supporter. Why didn't you expect her to be a Kaiser chief supporter, right? White, female, right? Uh, from the Santon area, quite affluent and so on, dresses in a particular way. What came out was that she actually was a semi-professional football player at a certain point, and uh, she had worked for FIFA, okay, um, uh, which is a you know soccer organization, football organization ba based in um, in Switzerland. All right, so she probably knew more about football than anyone else in the room, but they had stereotyped her in that particular way. Next week I'll talk about stereotyping, right? So are you judging yourself as the only one based on a demonically inspired lie? Because when you feel like you're the only one, you get discouraged, don't you? You end up thinking to yourself, no one identifies with me here. I can't talk to anyone. There's so many ramifications with that way of thinking, right? Often we think we are by ourselves because of our perception of in and out groups, okay? Uh, and often it's an irrational way of measurement, okay, of measuring ourselves, right? Often when people get depressed as they go through difficult challenges in their lives, it's because of a misbelief that they're the only one going through this. And then that opens a door to self-pity, which, by the way, is a quick way of attracting demons, okay? Uh, in scripture, one of the encouragements that we're actually given is that we are not alone, okay? If you look in scripture, it will say, you know what, brethren? Do not worry in this ordeal that you're facing, this persecution that you're facing. Know that your brothers all over the world are going through the same thing. Once you realize that you're not the only one, it's amazing what ends up happening. OK, uh, sometimes you have to sing to yourself, you know, the Michael Jackson song. Um, you are not alone just to boost you a little bit. OK, maybe I should get Michael Jackson to be the one actually uh, doing that. OK, but I think, you know. Uh, uh, my talking voice is similar to his, you know, so I just not, now need to work on the, the singing voice. Okay. Come on, encourage me. Give me love. Give me love. Give me love. <laughs> now, the consequence of believing that you're the only one suffering is that no one else understands. No one understands. And then you get into extreme self-pity and you end up making unfair judgments on other people and also being envious of other people. You know, they've got it good. I've got it bad. Life is not fair. OK, when you're facing certain challenges, it's important to remind yourself that this is not the first time someone is facing this particular thing. OK, not the first time someone is facing this particular thing. And it's not the first time this has happened to someone. There are many other people and actively look for those people. Right. Who you can identify with, because if you have a mindset that you know, I'm the only one, you won't look for those people because you think you're the only one. Um, let's have a look at first Kings and you see this in the life of Elijah, right? First Kings chapter 18. I'm going to read from verse 21 to 22 initially. Okay. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? You can see he was frustrated, right? If the Lord is God, follow him. This is how I sometimes feel as a pastor. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. So he was already making a comparison, right? He was already making a comparison there. And um, it was also a bit skewed for him to say he was the only one of the Lord's prophets left. And, and I'll explain why. Because remember, there were others who were in hiding. Right. So maybe you are saying I'm the only one who's coming and confronting Baal. I don't know. Maybe Obadiah, the prophet, was one of the ones who was uh, still in hiding. But uh, then look at first Kings 19 verse 10. He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. Now you sort of wonder, is there a bit of self-righteousness there? I don't know. Right. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're also trying to kill me. They're trying to kill me too. So he says it again. And then he repeats it again, word for word, almost exactly the same thing in verse 14. 
So he's saying the same thing about three times, which shows me he was now ruminating. I'm the only one. I'm the only one. I'm by myself. I'm by myself. I'm by myself. I'm by myself. And it becomes a cognitive distortion. It becomes part of his identity and he ends up getting depressed. Okay. So do you often feel like you're the only one who's giving? Or you're the only one who's really praying strong prayers? Or you're the only one who's really loving people in the church? I've seen people in the church, sometimes they talk like they're the only one doing a particular thing. You don't know what everyone else is doing behind the scenes, especially because the Bible says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing when it comes to alms giving. I'm not talking about tithing, right? I'm talking about alms giving when it comes to doing certain things for the poor. You don't know uh, who we've paid school fees for in the background or who we've paid varsity fees for and so on. You don't know. But sometimes you have people like who are strong givers making the assumption that they're the only one who's doing things. Let me tell you something. There are things happening in the background that you might not be aware of, okay? So don't make unrighteous and unfair judgments because let's look at the truth of this situation, okay? Let's look at the truth of this situation. Um, you see, often such thoughts are a reflection of pride and a lack of social awareness, Social awareness is basically to do with being aware of what else is happening around you. And it leads to self-pity and self-righteousness. And we need to be careful of this, okay? Um, in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18, this is where we see the truth. It says, this is the Lord speaking to him, Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. Okay? So, we see that God is actually declaring to him that don't worry, there's still 7,000. Now, obviously, Elijah was not conscious of the 7,000. He was just conscious of his situation. And he kept repeating it and repeating it, repeating it. Okay. In Acts 18, verse 10 to 11, this is uh, how Paul was encouraged. For I'm with you. Okay. And no one is going to attack and harm you. Okay, so he has an angelic visitation and this is what happens. For I'm with you and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. Okay, so he might have been feeling discouraged, feeling alone, but God had to remind him that I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half teaching them the word of God, right? So that encouragement caused him to stay on in a particular place. Have you come off your post, right? Have you stopped doing what God has called you to do because you think you're the only one and there's no point carrying on? You think you're the only one praying. You think, oh, there's just a few people in this prayer meeting. What's the point? Okay. Have you come to that point? And maybe you need a message from the Lord to actually say, you know what, you're making a difference so that you can be like Paul the apostle who ends up spending a year and a half further, right? In Corinth, teaching them the word of God. Maybe that's what you need to hear. You see, God is reminding you right now that you are not alone, that there are many like-minded people that are standing with you and are actually for you. I want to encourage you with those particular words. Can you see how these cognitive distortions actually end up affecting key decisions that we end up making in our lives? I want to encourage you to go out from here and making sure that you are labeling things accurately, making sure that you're not making unhealthy social comparisons. It's so, so important that we, we understand these things. Let's pray. Father, may you come and do what only you can do. May you come, Father, with the very life of God in our midst. May you come, Lord God, and help us as our minds get renewed, as we begin to understand things from your perspective. Come and have your way, Lord, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Use our prayer strategies. Read the notes. You can get them from the website and make sure this gets into your spirit. Amen.